Good afternoon and welcome to FISRA's live webinar on the three proposed rules for credit unions in Case Populaire. We're going to allow a couple of minutes for everyone to join us and then we will get started. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alina Twain. I'm a director of policy support and approvals for credit union and prudential division, and I will be your MC today. First, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for today's webinar. Mark White, FISRA CEO, Guy Hubert, EVP of credit union and prudential division, myself, my colleague, Dan Padro, director of credit union policy and policy division, and from my own team, Bradley Hodgins, senior manager, credit union and prudential division. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to remind everyone a few rules of engagement. As an attendee, you have been automatically muted and your video turned off. Once we approach Q&A segments, you'll be able to direct your questions to us via the moderated Q&A icon on the top right hand side of your screen. To submit your question, type it into the Q&A box. To remain anonymous, please check off the anonymous box before hitting submit. Once I receive your questions, I will be reading them on the line and redirecting you to our speakers. This webinar is recorded and a recording along with the transcript presentation deck and any unanswered questions from the Q&A period will be available post event on the FISRA website. Now let's move on to the main event. As most of you know, FSRA launched public consultation on the three new proposed rules to make credit union supervision more effective and efficient. To encourage enhanced understanding, transparency, and to support the public consultation on the proposed rules, FISRA is hosting today's live webinar, which we hope you will find informative. And with that, I turn it over to our CEO, Mark White. Mark? Thanks, Alana, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today for FISRA's technical briefing on the three proposed rules for credit unions and case populaires. With close to 2 million members and uh, 80 billion in assets, Ontario's credit unions are very important to the province of Ontario and our economic well being, as well as to the financial well being of members. As you know, uh, FISRA is the prudential and conduct regulator of credit unions, and we're committed to financial safety, fairness, and choice for the credit union members. Our overarching goal is the protection of credit union members. We do this through effectively and efficiently regulating credit unions to help ensure they're financially strong and well managed, and to help ensure they have high standards of business conduct. Overall, that they treat their members well. We aim to have a strong, sustainable, competitive, and innovative credit union sector that serves its members by taking reasonable risks. The credit union sector has been thriving in recent years, dealing well with the pandemic adversity, growing faster than its bank competitors by many metrics, and is continuing to evolve so that it can meet member needs. And to support the sector, in 2020, the government passed new credit union legislation, what I'll call the CUCPA 2020. That act aims to provide a legislative foundation for the credit union sector to continue to grow and to serve its members. To enable the implementation of that new act, to support the credit unions and their members in this rapidly changing financial services landscape, and to better regulate credit unions through dynamic, principles-based and outcomes-focused regulation. FISR is proposing the three rules we're talking about. They outline principles-based, sound business and financial practices, and they establish more risk-based capital and liquidity rules and reporting. Sound governance and financial strength are necessary for credit union success, but we're also mindful 
the credit union sector is a diverse sector and that our rules and our supervision need to work for credit unions that are differently situated. These rules should help credit unions to be well managed and well governed and for their risks to be better understood and mitigated so that those credit unions can better serve their members. We believe these rules will, when implemented, contribute to the public trust and confidence in the sector and to the sector's success in serving its members. These rules and this briefing are part of our continuing work to make our supervision more efficient and effective. Our goals today include transparency and enhancing understanding. So the FISR team will first provide an overview of the proposed rules and will then be pleased to answer your questions so that we can hear from you. I thank many of you who have already provided input into the proposed rules through working groups and bilateral discussions and directed consultations. And I look forward to all the comments we're going to get from the stakeholders today and throughout the consultation. With that, I'll hand it over to Guy Hubert. Guy. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to all of you in attendance today. Stakeholder engagement has been fundamental to the development of the uh, three proposed rules that we're going to be uh, taking a look at today. We're looking forward to reviewing the rules with you today and hearing your questions and understanding how we can provide further clarity. Our proposals for sound business and financial practices, capital adequacy and liquidity adequacy promote stability and streamline related requirements. The changes are informed by best practices across the financial services sector and in other jurisdictions in manners that are suitable for cooperative financial institutions. While we are taking questions today, I still encourage you to submit your formal feedback on the public consultation pages on FISRA's website. The consultation period opened on June 14th and runs until September 14th. I think we're ready now to take a closer look at the three rules, so I will pass it back to Alina. Thank you, Guy. There will be two presentations today with the opportunity to ask questions after each one. You can enter your question in the Q&A feature at any time during the presentation. And now I'm going to hand over the floor to Dan. Over to you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, and now I'll walk everyone through the agenda slide just before we get started on the presentations. Uh, so we've already done the introduction and thanks to Mark and Guy and Alina for providing their opening remarks. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a background and then after that I'll get into the overview of the sound business and financial practices rule. And after that we'll stop for a question period uh, where as Alina mentioned you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions uh, relating to that rule. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague Brad Hodgins, who will give an overview of the capital adequacy and liquidity adequacy rules. And after that, we'll have another question period with Brad where you can ask questions about those two rules. So now for a bit of background. Uh, so as, as was mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, the main goal of this session is to provide an overview of the proposed rules and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and I'm hoping this will be helpful for those that are here today. Uh, some of you are likely reviewing the rules within your organizations and preparing written submissions, uh, and we're looking forward to receiving those. So hopefully this, uh, this presentation would be helpful in assisting you in, in preparing those submissions. Uh, so as Mark noted in his opening remarks, uh, these rules will be made under the new Credit Unions and Case Populaires Act 2020 or the CUCPA 2020. Mm -hmm. And that act was introduced by the government last fall. And the rules are important because they'll update existing requirements and they'll form a substantive part of the credit union regulatory framework. Uh, as also was mentioned in the opening remarks, FISRA is shifting the existing regulatory approach for credit unions to be more principles based and outcomes focused. A principles based framework facilitates a more collaborative model between FISRA and our sector partners in order to achieve desired regulatory outcomes in a flexible way. And when we talk about outcomes or an outcomes focused approach, what we really mean is that desired outcomes might be set, uh, but, but in terms of achieving those outcomes, we wouldn't, we wouldn't prescribe the way that an institution would achieve those outcomes. In most cases, I think most would agree there is no single approach to achieving desired outcomes. Therefore, an outcome focused approach provides more flexibility to institutions to determine exactly how to achieve those required outcomes in a manner that makes most sense for them. <clears throat> 
So if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, so we'll first discuss the proposed sound business and financial practices rule, and then later I'll turn it over to my colleague Brad Hodgins to speak to the capital and liquidity rules. So the proposed sound business and financial practices rule would replace the existing DICO bylaw number five. And, and some of you may know that bylaw number five already has the legal enforceability of a rule under the current legislation. Uh, and, and actually because of that, FISRA has the authority to develop this rule either under the current CUCPA 94 or the CUCPA 2020. We have the same rulemaking authority under both acts for this rule. The new proposed rule would support a principles-based approach and set outcomes-focused requirements for a number of aspects relating to governance, uh, which would include subsidiary governance, uh, operational management, oversight functions, and enterprise risk management. Uh, the content of the rule was informed by best practices across jurisdictions, both Canadian jurisdictions and internationally, uh, as well as other regulated sectors. Uh, in addition, it was also informed by our own supervisory experience. So now we can move on to the next slide for an overview of the draft rule. We've heard from participants in the sector that it's important to recognize the diversity in the credit union system and that a one-size-fits-all approach isn't appropriate for Ontario credit unions due to that diversity. So we've designed the rule to be principles-based, and once it comes into force, many of the prescriptive elements that currently exist in the Bylaw 5 framework would be eventually phased out. It's designed to be applied proportionately in a manner that's reflective of the nature, size, complexity, and risk profile of the individual credit union. And you'll see that language a few times in the rule. Uh, this gives institutions flexibility in terms of how they ad adhere to the requirements or the outcomes focused requirements. It also addresses some areas that are currently not explicitly covered in bylaw five and therefore would serve to better accommodate a broader scope of business activities and different ways of conducting business with credit, which credit unions may engage in in the future. And that's particularly relevant in the context of the new CUCPA 2020, where credit unions are going to have added flexibility in terms of how they conduct business, the types of business they conduct, and, and uh, what they conduct through subsidiaries. So this slide that you see on the screen right now highlights some of the key areas that are more explicitly addressed under the new proposed rule than they are under the current framework. This includes the recognition of credit unions as member governed institutions which adhere to cooperative principles in their governance. Uh, it sets requirements for ethical and responsible action for the board and management. It has features and requirements for oversight functions uh, which are important in the context of the three lines of defense. Uh, and also includes requirements around governance of credit union subsidiaries. So now we'll get into an overview of the specific content or the meat of the rule. So I'll go through the 15 different sections of the rule at a slightly high level to begin with and then focus on some key areas. But of course, we can come back to areas where you have more questions or want more clarity during the question period. So just before getting into the content, I'll note that a number of credit unions would likely already have policies and procedures in place that achieve the outcomes covered here. So this is an all new ground for everyone. And that being said, uh, the rule aims to ensure that the desired outcomes are clear and codified so that credit unions can, can focus on them in their practices. So I think we can move to the next slide. Uh, so I'll start with requirements around cooperative principles. And the rule requires that credit unions operate and are governed in a manner consistent with cooperative principles. And it sets out those principles in the rule. This is something that was noted uh, during the last review of the CUCPA uh, by some sector participants as being quite important, uh, as cooperative governance is a key feature that differentiates credit unions from other financial institutions. The rule also requires clear and transparent communications uh, with members which highlight their democratic rights. It also sets outcomes focused requirements for the composition of boards and skill sets for, for directors. And, and these requirements are not going to look the same for every institution. They're actually intended to be applied in a proportionate manner. It also sets out board responsibilities in the oversight of the institution. And in addition, in addition to that, it sets out responsibilities of senior management and it differentiates the responsibilities of senior management from those of the board to ensure clarity and the distinction between the oversight rules of the board and operational rules of management. Uh, 
The rule requires credit unions to operate and be governed in an ethical and responsible manner. Uh, and this would include ensuring consistency between a credit union's policies and its values, ethics, and market conduct code, which is something that credit unions would have to have in place under the new CUCPA 2020. It also requires that credit unions adopt a whistleblower, blowing, a whistleblower policy, and that's really to encourage and promote the reporting of any wrongdoing and to ensure that individuals within the organization feel comfortable doing so. It sets out requirements around reporting processes and controls, uh, which would need to provide timely and accurate information, and not just relating to the credit union itself, but also on any material risks that a credit union may be exposed to from its subsidiaries. It sets out requirements around remuneration policies, including a requirement to disclose the policies to their members, as well as outcomes to ensure fair and responsible remuneration, which are which are consistent with those that are accepted internationally and codified by the Financial Stability Board in their in their principles of sound compensation practices. The rule also defines the oversight functions of the credit union, and it lists four specific oversight functions of of, of institutions. Uh, those four functions are internal audit uh, or the third line of defense, uh, risk management, which is often referred to as a second line of defense function, or compliance and finance, which, which can be second line of defense and in some cases could even be first line of defense as part of operational management. Now, because of the role that oversight functions play within the institution, they are required to have sufficient resources, status, authority, and independence to be able to operate in the oversight role effectively. Now, in the rule, this is drafted as an outcomes-focused requirement and would be applied proportionately given the characteristics of the institution. The rule also acknowledges that some credit unions carry out their oversight functions in-house, whereas others may outsource some of those functions to third parties. So the rule would permit either. And in the case of an outsourcing arrangement, the credit union would be required to have a member of senior management uh, who is ultimately accountable. And in particular, a key feature on the, on the risk management side is that the credit unions would need to have a board approved enterprise risk management framework in place. And, and I know most credit unions would already have something like that in place. The rule is explicit that credit union boards have a responsibility when it comes to subsidiary governance. And, and this and, and would be required to include subsidiaries in the board's overall enterprise wide oversight responsibilities. Now, this doesn't mean that a credit union has to actively govern its subsidiaries and approve policies and procedures in terms of the operation of its subsidiaries. But what it does mean is that a credit union would have to have oversight over its subsidiaries and a line of sight into the operations. Uh, so they would need to have a framework or policies and procedures in place that set out how they provide that oversight over the subsidiary. And finally, the rule requires that a board approved operational management framework be put into place at the institution. Uh, and to be clear on this point, it would be the board that would be approving the framework and providing the oversight, but it would be management's responsibility to implement, execute, and operationalize the framework. So now that I've walked you through the key elements of the proposed rule, I'll turn it back over to Alina and see if there are any questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Dan. Thanks, Dan. We're... Moving forward to the next question. Uh, I hear there's a bit of feedback on the line. But I'll, I'll do my best and we'll uh, read the questions that we have come in. So question one, and this one is, uh, I think, for you, Dan. How is involvement in subsidiary governance consistent with the subsidiary being a separate corporation? So subsidiary governance, so, so when we drafted the provisions around subsidiary governance, what we're not suggesting is that a credit union uh, be actively involved in the day-to-day -day governance or operational management of the subsidiary. Subsidiaries, as you know, have their own boards and would have their own governance processes in place. They would set their own policies and procedures and have their own frameworks, which would be approved by their board but the credit union is still exposed to the risks of the subsidiary. Uh, 
So, so the credit union would need to have an oversight framework in place to ensure that they have appropriate oversight over their subsidiary and any material risks that the credit union's exposed to uh, 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 as a result of their subsidiary would need to be included in the reporting process. Thank you. Um, the next is a more generic question, and I think the, the, the question speaks to whether or not if anyone has a specific question regarding the meaning of a particular wording or section, um, what would be the best mechanism for getting such information? Uh, so if anybody has sort of a technical or detailed question like that uh, around wording, language, um, uh, they can feel free to contact me at any time. I think we're going to post my contact information at the end of this presentation. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me and, and I'm happy to, uh, to address your question or direct you to the right person on the team who can do so. Thank you, Dan. Um, our next question is on uh, section 5.3 Roman numeral 2 and section 9 sub 1. And the question is, how does the, how did those sections fit within generally accepted corporate governance principle that the board has one employee, the CEO? So sorry, and I and I'm I'm referring to the the specific section. Um, uh, I I actually wonder if that's something that um, we could have a little more detail on. Um, sorry, Alina, can you repeat the section number? Section five three and section nine one. Okay, so section five three said that says that the board is responsible. Uh, for providing oversight, supervision, and direction to management, and shall oversee a number of elements of the credit union's operations, including uh, including its subsidiaries, uh, various initiatives, policies, and processes, its code of market conduct. So what we're saying there is not that the credit union should be involved in the day-to-day -day operational management of the institution or on those specific elements that are listed there. What we're saying is that the board uh, would be responsible for providing oversight and approving policies and approving the overall framework. The day-to-day -day execution, the day-to-day -day operational management, uh, and 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 ensuring that those policies, processes, and procedures are implemented and are are operating in an effective way would be the responsibility of management. Uh, the board provides the governance, and the board would have to approve those frameworks. Thank you, Dan. Um, this is a question about the whistleblower requirement for the whistleblower, and the question um, asks, how would you direct internal issues? And how do you, would you make that system impartial and unfair? And fair, pardon me. Okay, so so the requirement is that is that there be a whistleblower policy in place, and the intent, the outcome that we're trying to achieve there is to ensure that that individuals uh, feel comfortable and are encouraged to come forward when they are aware of any wrongdoings within the institution. How the whistleblower policy is set up is up to the institution. Now they would have to ensure that it meets the intended outcomes and they would have to look to best practices to ensure that that those that, that the policy is reflective of those outcomes and, and, and arrives at those outcomes. Uh, we're not going to prescribe exactly what a credit union's whistleblower policy must look like. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we've taken a principles based and outcomes focused approach to this. So that provides credit unions with the flexibility to determine exactly what their whistleblower policy will look like. And that might be different for different institutions in order to achieve the desired outcome. Thank you, Dan. The next question is on the board requirements and it asks whether the overall board skill set is a measure of the full board level or each individual board member and what's our expectation? So, so that is something that will be applied in a proportionate manner and that will also differ from institution to institution. So credit unions will need to determine given the characteristics of their institution, given the nature, size, risk profile, uh, of their of their credit union, uh, what an appropriate skill set is for their board, and and what the appropriate composition is, even in terms of size for their board, and that's going to differ. And and during the supervisory process, there are likely to be conversations between the institution and its relationship managers, its examiners, 
uh, to ensure that uh, that the board is of appropriate size and appropriate skill diversity. Uh, so we're not going to prescribe exactly what that looks like because, as, as we've said before, it will be different from institution to institution. Uh, but institutions should set that out in their policies and and uh, and 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 those discussions would would very likely happen at the supervisory process level. Thank you. Um, we have lots of questions coming in, so that's great. Um, the next question is about the uh, CRO role. So for the risk management role, um, does it need to be appointed by the board? And would this mean the board be responsible for their performance compensation? Or would the board simply appoint the individual? So, so what the rule requires is that the individual be appointed by the board. Uh, their compensation would have to be consistent with their remuneration policies, with the credit union's remuneration policies, which would have to be which would have to be developed uh, in accordance with that section of the rule. Uh, so, the credit union's remuneration policies would be board approved uh, uh, for for that level, uh, but the appointment of the CRO would happen at the board. Uh, but but as long as the compensation uh, is consistent with the credit union's policies, then then that would be consistent with uh, with the requirements as set out in the framework. Thank you. We had a number of questions on that topic, um, so thank you for that. Um, another question that's coming in is asking whether these are um, consistent with OSPI's model for a, for a Canadian financial institution. Would this be accurate? So, so as we developed the rule, uh, we we considered OSFI's model. We looked at OSFI's framework. Uh, we also looked at frameworks of other jurisdictions as well within Canada and internationally. Uh, I would say there are a number of components that do reflect the OSFI framework. It, it's certainly not identical. Uh, you know, as as I, I think either Mark or Guy said at the beginning of of the presentation, uh, uh, we we looked at at other jurisdictions, but also looked at what makes sense in the context of the cooperative financial system in Ontario. Uh, and you can't always apply um, every concept uh, from one jurisdiction to another, or from one type of regulated financial institution to another. Uh, but there are a number of areas uh, that are similar, and we did look. We did look to ensure some consistency. Again, I was going to chime in on that since I was at OSFI. Well, not the most recent version, but the previous version, and was oversaw. Um, and I think you hit on the key point. We have we did try to make sure we picked up the best practices, um, in a large extent, to make sure we can allow the diversity of the credit union sector to operate. We are probably a bit more principles based because it is so less prescriptive. Because we know there is great diversity, and also rec recognizing that these are cooperative institutions. And so, um, although we still have to cover some of the same issues about incentives, for example, um, you know, generally there are fewer um, issues that arise in an institution where sometimes um, um, there's a less alignment between the customers, the management and board, and the shareholders. Um, credit unions are unique in that respect. So um, that and to allow the greater diversity, I think we we are a little more principles based, but I do believe and glad to get comments on this if someone thinks we've left something out that OSPI covers. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Mark and Dan. And uh, the next question, we have a, a little bit of time for a few more questions. Um, the next question is around the uh, permission of the CEO to be on the board. Um, how does that um, address the separation between board and senior management? No, that's an excellent question. Uh, so the new act, the new CUCPA 2020, explicitly permits a credit union to have their CEO sitting on their board. Uh, now, there may be some limitations around that, uh, which will be later set out in regulations. I believe there's a regulation making authority associated with that to set some limitations or restrictions. Uh, but as a general concept, it allows uh, the CEO to sit on a credit union's board. So that was something that was hard coded into the new CUCPA 2020. Uh, and, and because it was hard coded into the act, uh, we felt it was important for the rule to speak to that point as well and to acknowledge that that is something that's permitted in the credit union system under the new legislative framework. Uh, and this is how that should look. So, so, so it's not something that the rule necessarily um, uh, permits itself, that that permission actually comes from the legislation. Thank you. Um, 
there's a there's a number of questions on whether um, FSRA will provide any uh, templates or best or share best practices um, for new policies and frameworks to support the new rules. Uh, so, so again, as I said, we're we're trying to take a principles based and outcomes focused approach to this. Uh, when you start providing templates and checklists and and things like that, it starts to get actually quite prescriptive. And the downside to that is that institutions uh, start to lose some of that flexibility that we were hoping to achieve through this rule in terms of how to achieve it intended outcomes. Um, it starts to become more of a one size fits all approach, and that's exactly what we were trying to avoid. So, so I don't think the plan would necessarily be to uh, release templates or checklists or, or documents like that. Uh, but of course, throughout the supervisory process, there are a number of touch points with uh, with your relationship manager, with your examiners, and those discussions can happen at that level to ensure that uh, that everybody's aligned in terms of whether or not an institution's frameworks, policies, procedures are achieving the intended outcomes. And 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 I'll just add, uh, you know, this is a point that we do we do hear from time to time from some institutions, uh, and 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 we do recognize that we do need to strike that that balance between flexibility and clarity. Uh, so if you do have suggestions that you want to provide in terms of areas that could be clarified more in the rule or maybe a little more specific than currently drafted, we would welcome those uh, in your written submissions during the consultation period. Thank you, Dan. Um, the next question is around um, in-house oversight of in-house internal audit um, and whether there's oversight of it in-house is sufficiently independent and whether it would be appropriate for the size and the complexity of the credit union. Yeah, so so again, that those are outcomes focused requirements in the rule that are intended to be applied on a proportionate basis. Uh, so that is something that might look different from institution to institution. The requirement is that there be sufficient independence uh, and uh, and and actually there is a definition of of what we mean by by independent uh, in the rule in the interpretation section, section one of the rule, uh, which which might be helpful for institutions when they are trying to assess whether or not uh, their internal audit or, or any of their oversight functions are sufficiently uh, independent uh, because again, we don't want to be prescriptive. We don't want to set prescriptive requirements. We want to ensure uh, that the oversight functions are operating in a way that's appropriate for that institution and that they have the right status, the right resources, the right independence uh, uh, on that basis. Thank you. Um, and just uh, we're going to take one last question as we're getting to time. Um, but please fear not, if your question wasn't announced, we will certainly answer your questions and make them available on our website. Um, and the last question is, um, how does market conduct fit into the proposed rules? Well, that's a good question. So, so the proposed sound business and financial practices rule um, uh, sets out a number of areas where a board would have oversight responsibilities. And one of those areas is oversight over its market conduct uh, code. Now, now I, I'm sure many uh, in the audience know that under the new CUCPA 2020, there's a legislative requirement for credit unions to have a market conduct code in place. Uh, the code is referenced uh, in the act and FISRA has the ability to supervise against it. Um, and, and from the perspective of the sound business and financial practices rule, uh, the board would be required to have oversight over that code and senior management would be required to have um, uh, to ensure that it's operationalized, uh, executed and implemented effectively within the organization so that the organization's activities are consistent with the code. So there's a responsibility at the board level and a responsibility at the, at the senior management level on two different aspects. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan, uh, for those uh, great answers. And I think we're going to have to close this particular Q&A period, but please fear not, we will take all of your questions and, and we will make the answers available on our website um, after the meeting. Um, we're now going to move uh, to our next presentation and I'm going to pass it over to Brad to talk about capital adequacy. Over to you, Brad. Thank you, Alina. And thank you, Dan, for that great overview of the Sound Business and Financial Practices Rule. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the privilege today of presenting on the proposed capital adequacy and the liquidity adequacy rules. Following my presentation on the proposed rules, I will be happy to address any of the questions that you have on these two topics. So let's begin with the capital rule. 
The current capital framework is detailed in three places. The regulation, which outlines the criteria and calculations for determining capital adequacy. The capital adequacy guideline, which provides additional details for the determination of adequate capital and the internal capital adequacy assessment process, otherwise known as ICAP guidance, which sets out the requirements for credit unions to assess their risk as it relates to capital adequacy. To echo what Dan previously mentioned as the impetus for change, the current capital framework is not reflective of current international standards. Proposed capital adequacy rule is designed to be more closely aligned with current international standards and best practices in a way that is appropriate for Ontario credit unions and is aligned with FISRA's transition to a principles-based supervi me, supervisory approach and the new risk-based supervisory framework, which is currently under development. The next few slides outline some of the key factors that were considered in the development of the capital rule. A couple of the areas that were not that are not captured in the current capital adequacy regime are the lack of both capital buffers and a focus on higher quality capital. The proposed capital rule will be based on the Basel III framework, which is more risk sensitive than the current framework and will enhance credit union resiliency. I'd like to thank everyone who's taken the opportunity to provide feedback on the capital adequacy requirements through the variety of stakeholder consultations that have taken place over the past several years. The proposed capital rule reflects the feedback provided through these engagements. FISRA completed a review of the capital frameworks used in other Canadian as well as international jurisdictions to better understand the requirements and best practices adopted in their frameworks. As mentioned earlier, sorry, back one. As mentioned earlier, FISRA is moving towards a more principles based and outcomes focused regulatory model. This is a collaborative model where Ontario credit unions work with FISRA to achieve the desired regulatory outcomes. While the capital rule does contain more prescriptive elements, such as the minimum capital ratios, these have been agreed upon with the sector through previous sector engagements and align with international standards. While there are changes proposed to the capital adequacy framework, I want to acknowledge that the sector is in relatively good shape. Since almost all credit unions currently meet or exceed the proposed capital requirements, there is no anticipation of any net new cost to the sector associated with the introduction of the new proposed rule. The requirements outlined in the capital rule balance the need for credit unions to maintain adequate capital to protect depositors while enabling credit unions to remain competitive and able to meet the needs of their members. We've talked about international standards and the, and the Basel III framework specifically already, as well as sector collaboration through sector engagements. So let's just skip ahead to the third bullet here, proportional. An outcomes focused approach leaves room for proportionality. For example, the ICAP requirements as detailed in the capital rule would be applied proportionally. This provides credit unions with the opportunity to comply with the requirements in a manner that is reflective of their nature, size, complexity, and risk profile. I'm sure many of you have already taken the opportunity in preparation for today's session to read through the three rules. That being said, this slide gives you an overview of the different topics that are captured in the capital rule. I will be happy to go into any of these sections in more detail during the question and answer period, but during this presentation, I will be focusing on the following topics, the changes to minimum capital ratios, the leverage ratio, as well as the addition to the cap the addition of the capital conservation buffer <laughs> 
The capital rule updates the existing capital adequacy requirements and introduces some new requirements, including those outlined in the table shown here. ICAP requirements that are currently detailed in FISRA's guidance are proposed to be moved into the capital rule, thus giving it force of law. I will provide additional details on the minimum capital ratios on the next slide, but for now, let me just walk through the changes at a high level. The minimum total capital, which is the sum of tier one and tier two capital, remains at 8% of risk weighted assets, but a new minimum tier one capital requirement of 6.5% of risk weighted assets is introduced. The minimum leverage ratio, which is currently set at 4% of on balance sheet assets only, will be amended to be 3% of both on and off balance sheet items. Please note that not all off balance sheet items are included in the leverage ratio calculation. And the capital rule clearly identifies which assets are to be included in this calculation. A new, sorry, back one. A new 1,250% risk weight category for high risk commercial entities and specific types of securitizations has been included in order to align with Basel III requirements. Credit union investments in financial technology or FinTech, as well as community projects would receive a 100% risk weight for investments up to a total combined amount of 1% of total capital. The capital rule sets out the following minimums that all Ontario credit unions must be in compliance with at all times. These updated ratios and the underlying elements to be used in their calculations are important because they bring the sector in line with the current international best practices. Under the Basel III framework, there is a category of capital called Common Equity Tier 1 or CET1 which is comprised of common equity and retained earnings. As credit unions do not raise capital through the issuance of common equity, only retained earnings would qualify as CET1. As an alternative to introducing CET1 as a separate metric, the capital rule adopts a minimum retained earnings requirement as part of the tier one capital, which is set at 3% of risk weighted assets. Please note, that in order to allow a newly incorporated credit union time that it would need to build up their retained earnings, the minimum retained earnings requirement would not be applicable for the first six years after incorporation. Credit unions would be required to maintain a minimum capital conservation buffer of 2.5% of risk weighted assets, which must be comprised entirely of tier one capital. This amount of tier one capital is in addition to the minimum 6.5% required to meet the minimum total capital ratio of 8% of risk weighted assets. Therefore, the minimum tier one capital component of the minimum total supervisory capital ratio is 9% of risk weighted assets. If the capital conservation buffer falls below this minimum amount of 2.5%, the credit union must implement a plan to replenish its tier one capital and limit distributions until such time that the buffer once again exceeds this minimum value. Before I take your questions on the proposed capital adequacy rule, I'm going to first provide an opportunity. I'm going to first uh, provide an overview of the proposed liquidity adequacy rule. Please take this opportunity to submit any questions that you may have about the capital, as well as the liquidity rule, into the question box. The rationale and the development of the proposed liquidity rule is similar to the capital rule, and therefore this slide looks very familiar to the one I presented a few minutes ago. The current liquidity requirements are detailed in the regulation and several FISRA guidance documents, and these include completion guides 
for the calculation of three liquidity metrics, which are the liquidity coverage ratio, the net stable funding ratio, and the net cumulative cash flow. FISRA recently updated the liquidity guidance this year, and the current framework is largely aligned with current international standards. The proposed rule more closely aligns with international standards and the migration of the requirements from guidance to the rule will strengthen enforceability and streamline requirements through the consolidation. The factors considered for developing the liquidity adequacy rule are similar to those for the capital rule. In order to enhance the liquidity framework, alignment of requirements with other jurisdictions was considered during the development of the proposed liquidity rule. Targeted st stakeholder consultations through a working group provided FISRA with the opportunity to validate the recommended approach and elements of the liquidity rule. In developing the liquidity rule, FISRA considered topics covered under the frameworks in other Canadian as well as international jurisdictions. As with the first two rules that we've talked about today, the liquidity rule contains elements that are principles based and outcomes focused. For example, the implementation by credit unions and by extension, FISRA's expectations of the Internal Liquidity Adequacy Assessment Process or ILAP. More prescriptive elements of the proposed liquidity rule, such as liquidity metrics, have been previously agreed upon with the sector and align with international standards. Since the substantive requirements of the proposed rule are largely in place through existing liquidity guidance, no additional material costs for the sector are expected with the implementation of the new rule. Almost all Ontario credit unions currently either meet or exceed the requirements specified in the liquidity rule. The liquidity rule includes updates to inputs used in the calculation of liquidity metrics to more closely align with the Basel III and OSFI frameworks. As with the other rules we have discussed today, the principle of proportionality is incorporated into the liquidity rule. Migration of requirements from existing guidance to the liquidity rule would strengthen the enforceability of the liquidity framework over the existing regime, while providing greater certainty and predictability for the sector. This slide provides the key topics that are covered and how they are laid out in the proposed rule. The majority of these items are part of the current liquidity framework and therefore should be familiar to many of you. As I stated earlier in the capital portion of the presentation, I will be happy to answer your questions about any of these topics. But for now, I would like to highlight the diversification, to diversification of funding topic. As outlined in the proposed rule, a credit union is required to include in its liquidity policy the standards, procedures, and limits for maintaining prudent diversification of funding sources. Requirements for diversification of funding are proportional and based on the liquidity profile of each individual credit union. Prudent diversification of funding sources includes minimizing dependencies on and concentrations within the credit union's funding sources. Next slide, please. The liquidity rule consolidates most of what's already detailed in existing guidance, but we've made some small adjustments to more closely align with Basel III requirements and best practices in other jurisdictions. I have briefly touched on the topic of Internal Liquidity Adequacy Assessment Process, or ILAP, a few times during this presentation. And this may be a new term to some, or perhaps many of you. The liquidity rule specifies the elements that a credit union must include in their ILAP. This includes the requirement for a credit union to implement reasonable stress testing scenarios and sets out, sets out requirements for credit unions to assess their risk as it relates to liquidity.
The requirements for the ILAP outlined in the liquidity rule incorporate many of the concepts and requirements outlined in the existing liquidity and stress testing guidance. In this presentation, I have tried to strike a balance between providing a high level overview of these topics while providing just enough detail to help you understand the scope of the requirements in the proposed capital and liquidity rule. I'm looking forward to your questions and addressing the areas where you would like to delve further into the details. I thank you for your attention. I will now hand it back to Alina to take us through the question and answer period. Alina. Hi, Brad, thank you for your for this and I will now move over to the question um, and answer period uh, for this uh, particular rule set. Um, so the first question we have is around. Um, asset risk weightings outlined in table two, it seemed to execute a few common exclude, pardon me, a few common assets to see use and therefore they only could be placed in the other category with the risk weighted of uh, 1,250. These include C1 Class A shares, investment grade and corporate bonds, as well as private equity. What is the intent and how would this put Ontario Credit Union, would, would this not put them at large disadvantage? Uh, thank you. I was just trying to find table two and now I found it on my screen here now. So, um, We can we can address those specifics as to uh, disadvantaging a credit union. That was never the intention as we put this proposed rule together. Um, the requirements as laid out in table two are aligned as close as we could to those outlined in the OSFI um, regulations and therefore. They would be held to the same standard uh, as laid out in that in that situation, so. Um, I think I'll introduce, let Mark, I think Mark wants to make a comment here. So, uh, or maybe I've misjudged. Yeah, um, yeah, no, no, sorry, I couldn't get my microphone on. That. Yeah, um, let's take a look at that. I mean, I would have thought that investment grade corporate bonds would not be rated 1250 because that's equivalent to deduction from capital. Um, I will say that we probably are going to have to hear some submissions on why something like private equity or an equity investment in a central would not be considered to be um, a deduction from capital because the, the norm is that capital, a, a equity risk requires a capital treatment. That's kind of the, the rule of thumb that I think you'll see in the Basel framework and in most uh, you know, risk weighting frameworks around the world. So um, we could probably take this offline, uh, but if, if investment grade bonds are indeed considered as a deduction, uh, that probably doesn't make sense. Um, but the private equity the, and the uh, shares in Central One, I think we need to understand why those shouldn't require a, a deduction from, or equivalent to deduction from capital. Thank you, Mark and Brad. Um, the next question is for those credit unions who are currently who are not currently in compliance with the proposed threshold of three percent or any capital threshold, what type of action plans are expected? So no trends. So I think the question is the transition period, I guess, would be another way of interpreting that. So at the time that the rule would come into force, which would be after the new act comes into force, um, at that time, the expectation would be that, and just to be clear, all well, the majority of credit unions currently meet the requirements as laid out in the proposed rule. And so therefore, for any credit union that would at that time or in the future fall below those thresholds, a plan would have to be brought forward. But if at the day of uh, coming into force of this rule, uh, you were offside of one of those metrics, you would have to apply, uh, put together a plan um, to FISRA to say how you were going to uh, once again meet those thresholds. So that's the expectation as it's laid out in the rule right now. So in the, in the rule, there is a section which states that upon uh, the rule coming into force, if you are not on side with these requirements, then you have to submit a plan to FISRA um, for our approval as to how long and how, how and how quickly you will get back on site. Thank you, Brad. Um, the next question is on Capital Rule 7, Sub 3. Are there any current plans 
uh, for FISRA CEO to specify any risk weights contained in Table 2 in Section ZZ? No, not at this time. So um, if there was a request, we would have to look at it. But as of right now, everything that we want is in that table currently. And uh, if there's something that is not in that table, then we can take that as part of the consultation period. Um, so please submit. Uh, as Mark said earlier, if there were things that uh, you believe are not in the right category or, or are missing, I should say, not the right category, but are missing, please submit those and we will review them as part of the uh, a review of the consultation documents. So we'd welcome any submissions on that. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, it's on the same point, um, but, but the question is of clarification. In Table 2 ZZ, is the intent of FISRA to have fixed assets, prepays, et cetera, risk weighted at 1,250%? Prepaid assets. Um, fixed assets, prepaid, and risk weighted. We'll have to take that one offline. OK. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Will profit shares held in capital accounts, example, profits paid into capital accounts in a member's name, be included in the 3% retained earnings requirement? They're not accessible generally to members and do form capital. If not paid, they would stay. So I can you, can you clarify the first part of that? So what part of the sure. member shares? Will the profit shares held in capital accounts, profits paid into capital accounts in a member's name will be included in the 3%? So, so, pay, so, so I guess this this is, pay, we're talking about patronage shares at this point that would be paid back. So um, they would be brought in as, as long as they meet the criteria as set out um, in the requirements for tier one capital, then they, they would be they would be brought in. Yeah, and that, that may be a case by case because I know that some or I believe that some patronage or profit shares have terms that they can be redeemed, in which case they may not meet the permanence test for retained earnings. But on the other hand, if it's just an appropriation of retained earnings, but is permanent capital, then I think you're right, Brad. Um, so that is something I think it would be good if credit unions looked at their own uh, profit shares if they want if they want to treat them as retained earnings and um, you know do the analysis and then ask us question during the consultation about which side of the line that's on and then of course you could then ask us to clarify where that line is if you don't think it's uh, clear because this that will be that may be a tricky question in some cases. Section 7 credit risk for corporate bonds investment and League Central One share investment. What risk weighting would they apply? Could you please clarify? Right, I think that's the question we already had. Yeah. That someone said it was 12 because uh, we were in the other category. They just that someone asked it a different way. So um, I think we undertook to look at that. But as I said, if it is equivalent to an equity investment in another institution, then 1250 is the norm, but um, and corporate bonds as I said, sh shouldn't actually be treated as. And I don't expect they would be treated as a 1250 percent. OK, thank you. Question on capital adequacy rule section 43. Um, can we get a clarity on the rule after deciding the policy question as to whether the five years should start from the day of issuance in the case of investment shares? subsequently issued as dividends on shares of the same class. In other words, consider any relevant reasons why the period should not start from the original issue date of the first shares. So you're saying that if after three years of the original investment share being issued, if we're paying patronage shares on those investment shares or dividends that are kept at the credit union, do they only have to be kept for another couple of years to, and still be I would have to say no in order to meet the permanence 
criteria, everything has to be five years. So if you're issuing additional shares based on those original shares, then they have to be held for five years. It's, it's because otherwise you'd be issuing permanent or you know, issuing dividends as shares in the fourth year and they would qualify as tier one for only the next year and then they would they could walk away and so that would sort of go against the the spirit and the requirements of the rule okay thank you um i do not believe we had this question uh section 72 table to uh bb in march you asked and put on higher potential limits for fintech and community investments. If the proposed rule still limits 100% risk weight to aggregate of 1% of capital, was there not sufficient rationale to raise this limit? A decision was made to leave that limit at 1% and we will welcome comments through the consultation period um, and any rationale and we will take that under advisement before we make a change. But the decision was made to keep it at the 1% for the purposes of the consultation period. Thank you. The next question talks about templates. Um, do you have draft templates of the new liquidity metrics, LCR, NSFR, NCCF, and the new capital me metrics so we can begin to quantify the impact on the credit union? Now, as far as the liquidity metrics, uh, the templates are the same. Um, Items that have changed as far as the liquidity metrics, the LCR, the NSFR, and the NCCF that have changed, it's just a it's a more robust listing. So what qualifies and what you would put into each category, we've been much more robust as to what qualifies um, for the different areas. And so it, it's taken out some of the guesswork as to does this fit into this box or that box. And so you'll notice in the rule, uh, these tables are extremely long, contain a great deal of detail and, and hopefully point you uh, better as to where you should be putting uh, the components or how you fill in the different components. But the template itself, we envision to stay the same. So the template that's there um, currently on the website is uh, will be the one that goes forward. We may have to change a few tweaking of the words, but the way you fill it out is, is the same way. Now, sorry, there was a question about the capital template. What was that question, Alina? Yeah. Uh, LCR and sorry, I've, I've moved off, but it's LCR and, and the SFR. So that so the liquidity ones, uh, as far as a capital template, uh, I'm not quite sure what capital template they are referring to. Um, there's the calculations that are currently in the regulations that, that will now be brought into the rule. Um, but as far as a template that you'd have to fill out, um, unless they're referring to the IMIR, uh, that would have to come up. That, that's under discussion right now. So perhaps certain aspects of the EMIR, the monthly filing will have to be updated and that's under that's under advisement right now. So as far as the timing for any potential changes to the EMIR, um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any changes at this point to the EMIR to reflect these changes to the proposed rule. Okay. But there's nothing stopping a credit union from taking into account, um, you know, the asset classes and the risk weightings that are outlined in this document to be able to see if there are any changes to um, their capital levels. Thank you. There's another clarification question. 3% um, of retained earnings minimum. Is that of total assets or risk weighted assets? Risk weighted assets. All, all of the metrics for capital, all of the minimum uh, capital ratios are based on risk weighted assets. The leverage ratio uh, is based on total assets as defined in the rule. Uh, currently on balance sheet, going forward, it will be the uh, combination of on and qualifying off balance sheet items. Okay, um, the next, thank you. The next question is, um, what is the rationale behind reducing minimum le leverage ratio from 4% to 3%? For those credit unions that have qualifying on balance, off balance sheet uh, assets that would qualify, keeping it at 4% uh, would result in, a, in a, a much higher hurdle in order to, to meet. And so um, to align with Basel, as well as that, ex that expression, or sorry, that explanation I'm trying to get out right now, is that 3% uh, is the international standard. 
um, and by including those those assets, off balance sheet assets, um, would be would be the right way to go. And so it was we're aligning with 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 the uh, with the Basel and uh, Austria interpretations in that regard. And so the inclusion of off balance sheet would be uh, regarded as being uh, extra extra penal in that situation. So that's 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 the explanation. Thank you. Um, to liquidity rules, um, will credit unions with assets less than 500 million have to report NCCF and NSFR or only LCR? Excellent. I like that question. Uh, no, no. That's this, this is where proportionality comes into play. So for credit unions with less than $500 million in total assets, the management and the board of the credit union have to have to make a decision as to whether they want to complete those uh, filing, or sorry, complete those calculations and, and present those to FISRA. And if they decide not to do that, then they have to put into place comparable um, examinations that would explain how, how they're ensuring that they have appropriate liquidity for time fr timeframes longer than the 30 day horizon that the LCR captures. So as long as they have comparable and, and comparable um, ways to measure their longer term liquidity risks and, and ensuring that they have appropriate liquidity over the longer term, then no credit unions under $500 million in total assets would not be required to submit the NSFR or the NCCF. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, on the diversification of funding commentary that's part of the presentation and links it back to off balance sheet positions and capital adequacy seems to be at odds. Why is holding of capital needed for risks that have been legally moved to a third party? I uh, will have to. Why we can are, take, we can take, take it that offline. one offline. Take that we one can offline. take it offline and, and, and answer the, the question in our. Uh, so another question is on section four sub five and requires uh, sec that section requires deferred tasks tax assets, except those arising from a temporary differences to be deducted from tier one capital. As per our understanding, deferred tax due to permanent differences is not recorded as an asset liability as the changes are reflected in the effective tax rate. So what is the rationale behind the inclusion of this item among other deductions from tier one capital? Uh, the rationale was to, to maintain consistency with best practices in other jurisdictions, and that included uh, Basel III. And so, and the, that was the rationale for that item, it was to, to, to ensure that the, the credit unions were being held to the same standard as other jurisdictions. Okay. Thank you. Just going to the next question here. Um, is the grandparenting of existing investment shares indefinite? So as long as an investment share that currently qualifies under the requirements as laid out in the regulations under uh, regulation 237, they would they would be allowed to continue. Now, indefinitely, I would have to say no, because investment shares um, after have to be included, can only be included as long as they qualify in the in the appropriate category. So yes, they could continue to qualify as tier two capital, but after a certain amount of time, after the five year period, a certain amount of the investment shares um, need to be, uh, for the calculation purposes, uh, need to be run off or put into tier two capital. Um, because after the five year period, there has to be an expectation as laid out that uh, up to 10% of the shares could be paid out to members and therefore would no longer qualify as tier one capital. So yes, they could continue to be called capital, but whether they would continue to be called tier one capital would depend on um, 
the provisions within the with provisions within the uh, prospectus of the investments and uh, would have to be you know, brought into tier two as, as appropriate as they are sort of uh, run down or not run down, but as they are expectation would be that they could be paid off, paid out to their to their members over time. OK, thank you. Um, as we're starting to run down the questions, uh, the, the the question we have is on the liquidity rule. Uh, section 5.8, Table 3G. Um, can you provide guidance on FISRA's expectations for credit union definitions of retail, quote, large deposit? Example, what constitutes large, or could there be a percentage of total deposits or other metric? So sorry, that was 5.8 subcategory. It's five uh, eight oh. table three G. Right. right. Okay. So that would have. We are allowing credit unions to define what a large deposit is, but that is why, as part of the completion of the templates, um, is that credit unions should be putting in what their expect that what their assumption is. So, what? How are you defining a large deposit? So then, FISRA can review how you have defined large deposit, and if we have a concern about its size, then we can get back to you. So the current uh, the current templates as laid out do have the ability for credit unions and the expectation of credit unions to be writing those types of uh, assumptions as to how they've defined these metrics. Good, very good. Staying on the same uh, section 5A, table 3H, trust accounts. Um, trust accounts have a runoff rate of 10%, but should they not be included with B, where there is an established trustee relationship with a runoff rate of only 3%? Uh, the rationale behind that was that we believe that those would be, those could be moved a little bit more um, if the only relationship with a credit union was through a trust account or a brokered account for that for that matter, then that money would be considered a little bit more hot or could move more freely. And so for that matter, you could not make the argument that the long term, I mean, if, if the credit union wants to make the argument and put that into the assumption as to how they've done it, we can review that at that point. But the expectation as this table has been laid out would be that from a trust account, um, the trustee could move that money freely. There's not a long standing relation. If the only relationship with the individual member is through a trust account, as opposed to having a mortgage or other other avenues that the, the member is using, the expectation would be that that is a fairly lean relationship and therefore the assets could, or the, sorry, the deposits could leave more freely. Thank you. And as we're winding down the time, uh, there's actually a question um, uh, for Dan with respect to uh, sound and financial business practices and in terms of uh, the transition period. Dan, would you be able to speak to that? So so are you, you're referring to a transition period uh, for credit unions to comply with the new requirements in the rule? Correct. OK, so so the sound business and financial practices rule. Um, so, so as you mentioned earlier, um, all of these rules are, are going to be made under the new CUCPA 2020. Uh, that legislation has not yet been proclaimed into force. Uh, and when it was introduced last fall uh, as part of the, the fall budget bill, uh, the government made an announcement that it would proclaim the new act into force in 2022, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, there was no specific date in 2022 that was provided. So, so the government's commitment was to proclaim it into force at some point during the year. Uh, and uh, so we're currently now working on these rules. As Mark mentioned in his opening remarks, these rules are, are necessary in order to um, uh, in order to be able to implement the new framework and have it proclaimed into force. Uh, so we have a process uh, to develop these rules, and as part of that process, it has to go to the minister for approval uh, once we finish the consultation period and finalize the rule. Uh, so, so what our plan is is to work with the ministry uh, so that we coordinate timing, uh, so that uh, so that we can consider an appropriate transition period between when the rules are finalized and approved and when the provision in the new act uh, is proclaimed into force. Uh, of course, if you have thoughts uh, in terms of what an adequate transition period for the sound business and financial practices rule would be, 
we certainly welcome uh, we certainly welcome that feedback uh, through the consultation process. Uh, we're certainly happy to consider uh, the thoughts that you have, uh, and we can take that away with us uh, as we as we work with the ministry to try to coordinate uh, you know an appropriate transition time. Uh, thanks, Dan. Just staying on the um, time to comply, um, there's another question on the um, liquidity and capital rules. Um, th the question is, um, it seems that the proposed capital rules will have a si significant impact on current ratios. Um, will FSRA look to apply an appropriate time for CU to comply? I think we answered a little bit of that, but perhaps we can um, address a little bit more clearly. So the changes, the changes to the uh, as I as I alluded to earlier, maybe I, I think I stated a little bit more clearly. I thought um, that we're no transition period is being contemplated at this point because the majority of credit unions are currently on side with all uh, capital requirements at this time. Uh, for those credit unions who are not on side, um, as as laid out in the rule. Uh, they have the ability to apply for a variance or an extension or transition period, I should say, um, to allow them to call, to get on site. But they would have to submit an application to FISRA um, asking for the ability to extend the period in which to which time they would have to be like, in full compliance. And the same thing happens after the fact. So whether it's at the point of introduction of the new rules or at any time in the future, if a credit union is is offside, then a plan has to come in. I mean, they have to apply for a variance at that point. So at the starting, they're asking for a transition period. Later on, you'd be asking for a variance to the to the capital liquidity rules. And so the same process, which is in place now for credit unions who would become offside, would exist at the transition, would, would exist at the time of the implementation uh, of the new rules. Thank you, um, and I think we're we're uh, pretty much uh, done here uh, and we're almost at time and we wanted to thank each of you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us today. Um, if you didn't have a chance to ask a question or your, your question was not answered, um, we will get to them um, and please feel free to email events at fsrao.ca and we will address them. Um, once again, this webinar was recorded and the recording along with the transcript and the presentations and any questions that we didn't get to today will be available um, on the FSRA website. We thank everyone and have a great day.